we've got a very fine panel of speakers and we've only got an hour, so the sooner we can start, the better. You, um, those of you who were in the, um, the awards presentations yesterday will have heard me say that I think the major effort now is going to move over to uh, focusing on the pioneering work that needs to be done with responsible tourism in destinations. That doesn't mean that the, the, the heat will come off the tour operators. We will continue to look at that and we'll continue to look at hotels. But one of the areas where we need to make progress very quickly is in the area of managing tourism more sustainably at the destination level. And in part, that's driven what is by what is likely to be the major theme of Responsible Tourism Day here at WTM next year, which is the focus on the problems of over-tourism, which have been coming up in one session after another um, during World Travel Market, and not only in the Responsible Tourism sessions. It's very much the, the issue of the moment. Um, could I ask how many people in the room actually represent a destination? Can you put your hands up a bit higher so that the panel can see? Thank you very much. Um, that's more people than we normally get from destinations um, at these sessions, but it does in a way reveal, I think, what part of the challenge is. But at WTM in particular, the people from destinations are downstairs selling, and rightly so, that's what they're here for. Um, and I understand that, and I think we need to think, WTM and I need to think really carefully about how we do this in the context of the fact that people are downstairs trying to do business. But that's not an issue for today. It's a problem for me going forward. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce all of these speakers. Um, I've chosen a mix. I've got a, a new colleague, um, Professor Simon Quinn, who's at the Institute of Place Management at Manchester at Manchester Metropolitan University, which is my new academic home as well. So in a sense, Simon and I are colleagues, and I should declare that interest. Then we've got um, Benito, um, an interesting example of a country or a place which took preemptive action about the problems of sustainability really from the very beginning, an unusual case. It's a rare thing. After that, we're gonna have um, Juan Torella talking about Barcelona which is a place which for a number of years, in fact long before we became aware of it, has been looking at the problem of how it copes with its success and managing tourism. Fascinating case for us to look at. Then we have Caroline Warburton talking about the national tourism strategy work that she does. It's an interesting example because it's a private sector managed program and very rarely do you see destination management and destination development done by private sector organization. And then um, Nick Greenfield, who's the head of tour operator relations at the European Tour Operators Association, sorry, the European Tourism Association, is going to wrap up the session. I've asked them all to be fairly brief. They've been given eight minutes each. There are five of them. That makes 40 minutes. So if they all stick to their time, there will be 20 minutes for questions at the end. And there's a very nasty red light here that comes on. And when that comes on, you have to stop talking. Those are the rules. So Simon, can I ask you to come first? Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, this topic session is about place management and destination management, and I thought it would be helpful, particularly given that there are not many of you here from destinations, to actually talk about what we mean by place management, first of all. Um, we have an institute that I work for, which has been set up, which is an international body, and we very much feel that responsible tourism is part of that institute. But we have a helpful definition of place management to start off with, which I think will guide what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. And this comes from the journal, the academic journal that we publish, uh, and it basically says place management is a coordinated, area-based, multi-stakeholder approach harnessing the skills, experience, and resources of those in the public, private, and voluntary sector. Now, it's important, I think, to put that definition out there, particularly as we, I now understand, going to hear entirely from private-led destination management scheme. Because on the whole, I think our view is that it is better when there are a number of parties involved. So this is not necessarily government-led initiatives. It's not private sector-led initiatives. It's not bottom-up initiatives. It's this combination of things. But what you will also notice there is that this says it's about an area-based initiative. 
And that area can vary from the size of a village up to a whole country. And we have members in the Institute who represent different kinds of destinations. So what are we talking about when we talk about an approach or um, a movement? Um, we're really thinking about thinking of a place in all its aspects. And so we have helpfully four words in English that begin with A, which describe really what has to happen if you're going to make a place work. Firstly, you have to think about what it has to offer, and that's really the attractions. What is it that is going to draw people to that place? Now, if you have a very strong attraction, say like London's West End, then people will put up with access difficulties to get there. But the weaker the attraction, the more important accessibility becomes. And really, we want to be thinking about accessibility in all its forms. It's not just getting in and out of the center or the place. It's moving around within it. It's providing access for servicing. It's providing access for people with disabilities. And it's thinking about the sustainability of the place as times change. Is this going to be a place that is accessible in the long term? Often we're talking about access by a choice of means of transport. So we talk about the, what it has to offer, we talk about getting into it, but what is the quality of experience like when you're there? And that's really what amenity covers. It is, at its most fundamental, I guess, clean and safe. That doesn't mean that places cannot be edgy. Some places need to be, that is what they thrive on, but they shouldn't necessarily be dangerous or unsafe. We talk about the quality of the environment, the customer service that you're going to get there. That's all part of this place management approach. But we also need to think of the 4A, which is, fourth A, which is action. Things like place marketing, things like place branding, but most importantly, perhaps, a vision and a strategy. Does this place know where it's going? How are we dealing with the challenges that are coming up to it? So the 4As help provide some framework for thinking of place management. I just wanted, in the final few minutes, to give an example from something that is ubiquitous, really, town and city centres. A lot of research has been done on what makes town and city centres great places. And at the core of it, really, is that they should be places that are both vital and viable. Both these words are about life. Vitality, however, has been defined to be about busyness, about activity, as you see here in this photograph. Viability is about the potential of a place to attract investment in the longer term, both by businesses that are already there and by new businesses who might come in. And what we found when we looked at town and city centres is that they're not all vital in the same way. We've been using footfall data. This is measuring pedestrian flow in town centres, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, now data over a 10-year period. And we thought most town centres looked like this that they had a Christmas shopping peak. Visitors came in from a wide area to that town centre in the months before Christmas. But we found this is not by any means most town centres. A lot of town centres look like this. The cathedral cities, the historic centres, the places you will be familiar with in a way as special destinations, have footfall that sees visitors coming in much earlier in the year and in quite considerable numbers. But there's still a Christmas shopping peak. So they're a different kind of place. They need different kinds of solutions. And then we have a traditional, perhaps, seaside town, a holiday town that brings visitors in in the summer, but is not necessarily serving its community well in the winter. And finally, we have lots of towns that actually have very little visitor appeal, but day by day they plod along, they do the same things. So this understanding of what kind of place you've got, we think is fundamental if we're going to have successful place management. Start off with the research, find the evidence, get that data so you know what is going to go on, and then you can start to manage it. Homeforth in Yorkshire is one of the towns we're currently working with, which isn't sure what kind of place it is. It was an industrial town. It became famous through the setting of a television series called Last of the Summer Wine that you may have heard of even outside of the UK. But we don't have footfall data from here. We have very little evidence about what kind of place it is. And yet, they've been trying to make decisions about its future without knowing how it's used. Ultimately, we believe that if you're going to manage a place, we need to think about this local intelligence. We need to think about input from a variety of players, the public, the private, and the voluntary sector. And that, fundamentally, is what place management is. And I think it has applications to destinations that are aimed entirely at tourists, to destinations that are visitors, but most importantly, to those places that are serving both the visitor 
and their existing community. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much indeed, Simon, and that was actually under time, so particularly appreciated. The next presentation is from Benito, um, which is in a fairly remote part of Brazil, although by no means the most, repart, most remote part. We have two people who are going to be part of this presentation, Julian Salvadori, who's from the tourism office and in charge of it, and Marco, Marcos Diaz, who's going to make some of the presentation for her. So if we could move on to the next slide on Benito. No. So good morning. It's an uh, honor to be here. And I'd like to say thank you, Harold, for inviting us to be here. And I'm Giuliani. I'm Secretary of Tourism in Bonito. And I'm Marcos, President of Bonito Tourism Board. So, so Bonito is located in the heart of South America in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul in Brazil. A part of Bodoquena Range, Bonito sits on a limestone plateau in the southeastern border of the Pantanal wetlands. And it's a blessed with amazing natural attractions. The next one will put the next. Okay, to, to explain a little more about Bonito. Bonito is an, uh, an ecological paradise that attracts tourists from all over the world. Uh, this is a small town, very small town, uh, located in the heartlands of Brazil, surprises everyone with its crystalline rivers with plentiful fish, grottos, and waterfalls. The limestone formations of Bonito create the pristine waters that allow visitors to see the underwater, underwear, oh sorry, underwater fauna, okay? <laughs> in natural aquariums. A little nervous, it's okay. <laughs> So a quick, quickly brief timeline. So uh, in 1948, uh, the city foundation. In 1993, the first program TV, a national uh, channel, and the first guide course, and the beginning of the environment course and concerts. In 1995, the uh, creation of the Municipal Tourism Council and the voucher system. So from 2001 until 2013, elected uh, the best ecotourism destination by the Brazilian magazine. And we won here in London the best destination for responsible tourism awards. In uh, 2014, we received the Ecotourism and Sustainable Tourism Conference promoted by the International Ecotourism Society. Uh, in 2014, 15, uh, we created the tourism monitoring system, and in this year we received the Adventure Week, promoted by the Adventure Travel Trade Association. So it's uh, a good story for a, a young and uh, small town in Brazil. So, um, Bonito has about 80 hotels, and about 5,000 beds and 40 natural attractions. So, and Bonito has an original destination measurement system that includes the voucher system, the carrying capacity, and the environment license. So each tourist needs a local guide tour for each vouchers can be issued and sold by the local travel agents. The voucher system is a part of a large environment management system of Bonito. Controlling number visitors' numbers, the voucher system also provides local government with a current visitor data and is an efficient way for collecting te tax. Tax, very important, the tax for them. <laughs> well, about environmental license, okay? Each natural attraction has a daily limit on the number of visitors. And it, this is stipulated in its environmental license awarded by the Environment Secretary. It's a state level public body, okay? Here are two examples of the environmental license. On the left, you have uh, one of the, for the municipal outdoor swimming area, which has a license for a 
1,000 people a day. This one of Abismayumas. Abismayumas is an underground cave which has a license for just 26, 26 people a day, okay? I think that all the capacity of the all attraction is more or less 5,000 people a day, okay? Well, but now the secret is I'm the president of this, the Bonita Tourism Board, you know? but the fact of the, the Brazilian tourists uh, consistently put Bonito as the best ecotourism destination is a clear indication that the destination offers an attractive, an attractive product. Okay? Key, key the planning and implementing in Bonito is the participative management through the Tourism Council. Okay, each 15 days we are there working. Okay? Which has members from the tourism trade, academic and cultural sector, environmental and legal sector and local government. Oh, it's mine. Taking care of our people and our children, we have two local people, local people okay? We also have a program uh, for local schools called the Get to Know Bonito Project. Open to children for eight to 13 years old, this project provides regular technical, technical visits to tourist enterprise and attractions. There are lectures or collaborative activities on tourism development in each technical visit. Although students are supportive of the development of tourism in Bonito, few have direct or indirect involvement with the area. Okay. The project also encourages the strengthening of local identity and contact with the nature. The project starts in October of 2013 and aims to become part of the tourist basic curriculum taught in Bonito's school. So uh, the voucher system provides a clear and dependable data for the tourism monitoring system. We will enable, enable us to mensure the impact of the, uh, on the town. So here we have an exam example. 50% of the, the jobs in, is in the tourism. And last year we received about 200,000 uh, tourists. And they left in, in our town about as uh, 100 million dollars uh, in our seat in our seat so it's a uh, good good numbers for us so that's it after we can talk more and a hug for you thank you thank you very much thank, thank you very much julian and, and, and marcos i should just add that this has been written up and it's in the that edition of progress and responsible tourism which was published yesterday with the um, with the, the results of the Responsible Tourism Awards in. And there's quite a lot of data and the history is there if you'd like to look at it. It is a rare example of a place which took preemptive action to manage its tourism from the beginning. We're going to switch now to Juan Torella, who's going to talk to us about Barcelona, where the challenge, I think, is very different. There we go from a small town in a remote part of Brazil to a major European city, an open city, on the Mediterranean with very good connectivity. It's very difficult to get to Benito. It's much easier to get to Barcelona. So what are you going to do, Juan, about the problems here? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. Thank you for inviting me, having the opportunity to share with you our experience in managing the city. In, in only 25 years, this right, in, in only 25 years, Barcelona has become a major European destination coming from being a city where the tourist activity was almost irrelevant. 1992 Olympic Games transformed Barcelona and it had to be taken advantage of. Tourism was an opportunity. The public-private model applied in the Olympics led to set up a new consortium created by both Chamber of Commerce and the City Council of Barcelona, aimed to promote Barcelona as a tourist destination. Barcelona, Barcelona's open aspect had, fe, had been widely felt and contributed to the city's success. And that means that an accelerated and sustained growth of tourist activity during uh, several years. For almost 15 years, this evolution was perceived as a clearly positive thing, but it was around 2006 that the first symptoms of problems have uh, appeared and showed that we need to review the path that we had taken and rethink 
our future. The City Council decided then to do a strategic tourist plan 2010-2015 aimed to promote a tourist model which will strengthen the balance between local residents and tourists while preserving the identity values of the city. During almost two years, it was a deep reflection with more than 800 participants, which generated a wide diagnosis with a high level of consensus and identified key challenges for the tourist management. Barcelona then had clearly understood the need for a whole of city government approach to managing tourism in the city, maintaining its economic importance while improving the citizens quality of life. A directorate for tourism and events was created with the responsibility for managing tourism and an innovative tourism and city committee was established which brought together many departments to coordinate actions to manage tourism. We start facing issues like promoting the concentration of tourist activity on the city, sharing knowledge over tourism, deploying a responsible tourist system, managing the main tourist spaces on the tourist mobility. Step by step, the plans are developed and implemented based on shared knowledge and agreed policies and actions. The tourist plans were integrated with the other city plans, most importantly, the municipal action plan. But during those five years, beyond its own attractivity, some global trends were raised, shaping the current tourism features and doing that Barcelona's tourism had continued growing. The growth of urban tourism at the global level is the, the first. Our geopolitical position in the Mediterranean Sea, probably, and the eruption on internet of the global sharing economy platforms. In this context of growth, in August 2014, there were protests about the negative impacts of tourism focused in the Barcelona neighborhood, some protests attracting over a thousand participants. Tourism emerged as an issue in May, 2000, in May uh, 15 elections that in Barcelona changed the government and that represents an inflection po and point in phasing the tourism effects strategy fostering both participation processes and a strong public leadership. Four main decisions were made in them, by them uh, at the beginning. Stopping licenses for tourism accommodation while a new plan was elaborated, promoting a new strategic plan, tourist plan, creating the city and tourist council as a main tool for participation, and improving the tourist knowledge. Let's describe those main examples. The first one is the tourism accommodation urban zoning plan. Less than half of all overnight visitors to Barcelona stay in hotels. The growth of new forms of accommodation creates challenges in regulation and management. The city council has to find ways of effectively managing and taxing those which has facilitated its spectacular growth. In July 15, the processing of new permits for tourist accommodation was suspended in order to analyze its impact and to draft a new urban zoning plan to regulate it. But regulation could be absolutely useless if we are not able to control the unlicensed tourist accommodation supply. The emergency inspection plan against illegal tourist flats was essential for it. Launched in July 2016, just this year, includes measures that fight against the illegal tourist flats through several means like detection, enforcement, intel authority, collaboration, regulation, awareness raising measures, etc. The second one from the fourth um, is what about the participation? Asking 2015 about whether or not there should be more debate about tourism between citizens, institutions, and business sector, 79% said yes, at only less than a 6% disagree. Committed with that, the city's government used participation strategy for doing things like to establish the municipal action plan or other specific queries. But the most important one, an innovative fact has been the creation this May of the City and Tourist Council aiming to represent the general public as a whole. The third one is the strategic plan, the new strategic plan 2020. The old plan finished in the end of 15 and was clear that, the, that uh, the need to be updated promoting the new one. There are, uh, in fact, there are considerable continuities in policy development on successive administrations in Barcelona and coming from the previous plan made. In fact, we rec recognize now that the old plan, two main goals, proved to be essential today. 
helping to improve tourist activities in Barcelona and ensuring tourists fit it in better with the city. From Feb February this year, um, from January, sorry, this year, we have been working on the new plan and in September, the results of work process of the diagnosis states has been presented. Structured into five areas, areas, we have identified 20 challenges and 80 goals that are the basis of the proposal phase which is going to end this December. And the last one is the knowledge base. The, de the development of a strong base of shared information and knowledge about tourist trends in urban tourism, as well as data specific to Barcelona, is critical for us to developing policies which can be successfully implemented to achieve agreed objectives. We work currently for creating the Barcelona's Tourism Activity Observatory for consolidating shared knowledge in tourism in a process that integrates the city of Barcelona with its surrounding, surrounding counties. The finally, our first priority is to address inequality. In the second one is the management of tourism, and of course, the two are not unrelated. In Barcelona, the tourists are everywhere, every day, an inviting group that arrives from the port and airport by car and by train. We try to take, ground, to take groundbreaking initiatives because we are determined to remain an open Mediterranean city and a tourist city, and tourists could be managed better. The issue is about the way the city is used by citizens and visitors, but the problem is not necessarily tourism. The public space is used by citizens and visitors together. Barcelona is a tourist city. It's a city with tourism, but it's a brand with a culture and lifestyle created and shared by citizens and tourists. It has to learn to manage tourists better, and we want to be a leading example of how tourists can be used to make a Barcelona a better place to live in and a better place to visit. Thank you. Th thank you very much indeed, Juan. That's another presentation that came in under the eight minutes. So thanks to everybody for that. There will be time for discussion. Just one quick point while Caroline goes to the... That must be Scotland, Caroline. While Caroline goes to the podium. Um, I've had t just two things to say in addition to what Juan has said. I have written up, and it's the, they've just approved the version I've written, of the history of the development of tourism in Barcelona since the Olympics, and that will be published in progress. So it's available there as an academic resource. What I'd also say is that WTM will be uh, putting these presentations up online, and there are a number of academics in the room. Please remember that those resources are there. Um, they tend to be a bit more up to, date, up to date than what's in the academic journals. Um, and certainly what's happening in Barcelona at the moment, I think is absolutely cutting edge in terms of coping with the problem of over-tourism, which will be a major focus of WTM next year. But Caroline, it's your turn to talk about Scotland. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I think I'm taking a slightly different tack um, in my eight minutes. I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through them very quickly. Um, I'm not talking about a town or a city, I'm talking about a region. Um, and in Scotland, it's very much about the sort of the regional destination groups um, that I've been asked to talk about today and the role of the private sector within those. The reason for this lovely picture is this is one of the current marketing campaigns for Scotland, and I thought it showed Scotland as a land of myth and of mystery um, and of romance. Um, but Scotland is also a land of destination groups as well. Um, and we have many of them. These are the regional groups, so these are not the local town groups. Uh, these are the groups that are covering a county or, or a larger region. And you may think, wow, that's a lot. Is that too many? But I think what it shows is the creativity but also the passion of the tourism industry in Scotland that they want to get involved and they want to have a say in driving the future of tourism in their area. So this is Scotland. Uh, the three examples that I thought I would give you today are from three quite different uh, parts of Scotland, but are also three completely different models. And each model has been uh, evolved due to the local circumstances of that region, the funding available, the geography of that region, the type of tourism businesses that are in that area, uh, and also the individuals that are in that area, both on a public sector from a government perspective, but also from the private sector and the energy that people have to get a group that works for their region. So first things first, Argyle in the Isles, 
Um, I don't know how many have heard of Argyle and the Isles. It has had a very low brand awareness, both in Scotland and in the UK, and no doubt further afield. It's a very uh, complicated area. It's a very beautiful area, 23 inhabited islands, over 3,000 kilometers of coastline, and it's very accessible from Glasgow, only um, a year, uh, an hour, sorry, from it. <laughs> Some people might think it's a bit like a year away, but anyway. So they decided to set themselves up as a cooperative. There were already 11 local tourism destinations in the area. And these groups had been established for many years. And there was a feeling that didn't want to compete with these organizations. So why not create an umbrella brand for the region? Um, and so each of the 11 uh, local associations joined into the cooperative as a member. So this cooperative has 11 members of it. And as a result of the industry coming together, all the other funding partners said, this is something that we can get behind, and money was made available to start to deliver. And as a result, they've created this fabulous brand down here on the right. Each of the regions has got their own brand, which fits in with the, the regional brand. They've now started to do marketing, which is compelling. They can go to travel shows collectively. They're starting to do video and media activities because there's an appetite for, to see the, the region and the destination succeed. And they're also beginning to get the, enough people and enough energy to start to create networking opportunities. And these initiatives down at the bottom, they're in a position to start to deliver the national programs through the destination organization directly. And they've actually got 11 what they call um, development agents in each of the regions who are just there on a part-time basis, a few hours a, a, a week, to go out to industry and to be that, that point of contact. And that's as a result of them coming together. Another well-known destination in Scotland, Loch Ness, um, is actually almost attached to the city of Inverness. And this group came together under a business improvement district um, model. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this um, approach. It started in North America. Um, and it's the only tourism business improvement district that we have in Scotland. This is a very democratic way of uh, generating revenue for tourism. Every business that is a tourism business over a certain level in terms of their rates has to pay a levy, and this is gathered, gathered by the local authority. So there are now 400 levy payers in this region, and they're create, generating over £170,000 a year. This group, which is all private sector or all tourism organizations, now has significant resources to start to be able to deliver on behalf of the region. Also, as a result of them having this leverage, the relationships with the government and um, local authority organizations have changed because it's not a money relationship that they need to have with them. It's now become a partnership so that they can work together to deliver um, common goals. And in particular, the Visit Britain campaign, which came as a result of this organization coming together, which has come up with some fantastic uh, storytelling around the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, and this has been an international campaign. The, tra the Social Travel Summit came to Inverness uh, this year. Apparently, they were trending second in the world. Uh, number one was the divorce of Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. <laughs> so they were pretty chuffed about that. So the third and final example is um, Visit Aberdeenshire. And uh, Steve Harris, the chief executive from Visit Aberdeenshire, is here today if you have any more detailed questions. This is an example of where three destinations that are all within the same region recognized that by working together, they could be more sustainable, but also more effective. So using the brand of Aberdeen as a city, but also using the surrounding area, the shire around it, which includes Royal Deeside, Cairngorm National Park, Balmoral, all of these kind of evocative places. So they all came together under one brand, Visit Aberdeenshire, which was launched this year. So it's a very new organization. But from a funding perspective, it's quite a different model. The private sector funding has come from this organization called Opportunity Northeast. And this is a private sector uh, organization with a few individuals who have put in a significant amount of money but they're not just investing in tourism, they're investing in the economy of Aberdeen and the Aberdeenshire region. 
And they've seen that tourism is an important part of the region, particularly as Aberdeen is an oil and gas city, and which is struggling at the moment, and there was a need to make sure that Aberdeen was, can be sustained by leisure tourism as well as just business tourism. So it's not individual businesses paying to be a member of this organisation, it's a, one organisation that is channelling that. And as a result, Visit Aberdeen has gone from eight staff an £800,000 budget, which is a very big budget for any DMO in, uh, in Scotland, to a staff of 16 and almost £2 million worth of budget. So by coming together, they've really started to make a difference and to make an impact. And marketing can start to be adapted, looking at apps, um, but also starting to evolve the leisure, the leisure brand. So my last slide, it is all about collaboration. It's all about partnership. And if the industry doesn't talk to government and the agencies, we will never get anywhere in terms of tourism in Scotland and I would suggest in other parts of the world. The pictures down on the right here are the Scottish Tourism Strategy, um, which is my role, and writ large on the front of that is uh, the future of our industry is in our hands. And the approach that we've taken in Scotland is that it is an industry-led strategy. That's not to say that it's only the private sector that is delivering it, not at all. The Scottish Government is behind it and all the agencies, but it's listening to the industry to say, this is our industry, what do we want to do with it? And the destination groups that sit under the strategy are as important to Scotland as any organisation or any business. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Caroline. Just while Nick goes up to the podium for the final press, you were under eight minutes as well, so we're doing very well. Nick Greenfield will, will speak next, but I wanted to make just one point maybe to put Nick's contribution in, in a context. Simon talked about the importance of partnership, and actually we've got three examples here of partnership, but they're very different. Yeah, we've got a partnership which from the beginning was public and private, but very much led by the city and the environmentalists. We've got a situation in Barcelona where in order to make sure that the destination management part of the job got done, you have recently separated management and marketing, because one of the problems in tourism is often people just do marketing and think that's management, and it's not. So Barcelona has separated it. Scotland is an extraordinary example because they've reversed the roles you'd expect. The public sector does the marketing through Visit Scotland and has enormous uh, budgets, and the private sector, with tiny public sector budgets, does destination management and destination development, which is very odd. Could you put this into a European context and reflect on some of these issues, Nick. You've got an awful lot of slides, but I know you're going to pick out the ones you want to yes, use. Yes, fantastic. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Nick Greenfield. I'm Head of Tour Operator Relations at ETOA. That's the European Tourism Association. First thing I wanted to say is our members, we're about 850 members, a couple of hundred just over our tour operators who bring people from all over the world into Europe and also within Europe. And the rest, 650 plus, are destinations, hotels, suppliers, the people that provide the product, just to make sense there. Now, when I was thinking about how to start and talk about what do you do, how do you manage a destination, what are some of the challenges, I was trying to think how to, uh, who we should be thinking about. And we've actually done three surveys in recent years that I think are rather relevant. So if I can take an example, which is Italy, and show you three surveys that we've done, and it will get you thinking about who we need to think about when we're thinking about how tourism works in a city. The first one is one from 2013, which we did uh, with our tour operator members, about 60 of them, large and small, from all over the world, answered this question, tourism in Italy, was it a friend or a foe? How do you find it? And we asked some questions like the value for money, for example, uh, how they rated things. You'll see they found city access arrangements a, a massive problem. But many other things were okay in the middle for them. Or alternatively, how they saw the tourist attractions. Again, you can see the infrastructure or perhaps the timely provision of information was an issue. You will notice, I'm going to be totally fair here, that the tour operators obviously rated everything from okay to a right pain in the backside. So I'm just being honest there. But then they have obviously things to deal with like city taxes, coach permits, parking fees, all these sort of things or also too much bureaucracy, the ticketing, the way they saw things, basically anything that they felt made their business too hard, too difficult. On the other hand, they said in Italy, it was actually the, the place itself, the history and the art, the history of monuments, the food, obviously, the fashion, 
or equally the landscapes, friendly people, topography, etc. This is what the tour operators said in our survey. Then there's a second survey we did in 2014 with group travellers, about 2,500 from around the world, especially Britain, America, China, Australia, South Africans, who were travelling in September and October on group tours. And we asked them, with our friends at Consumer Data, some questions. And we asked them to rate different categories, things like the welcome, friendliness, cleanliness, was it overcrowding, queuing times, quality and practicality. Now, the reason we ask these questions is a lot of people who visit countries get asked things like, is Italy pretty? Did you eat nice food? Kind of know the answer to that. But we don't always ask them about how they found the facilities. We thought it'd be interesting to see what they said. So they found certain things much better than expected. For example, they found the welcome, the friendliness. Italy, you do a great job of making people feel welcome, the kind of feeling of being part of the family. Uh, the thing that was always an issue for them was the overcrowding in many of the cities. You can see the cleanliness was generally OK, queuing time, so-so. And if I show you the next slide, you can see immediately the overcrowding was the big thing that sort of stood out for them. Now, we might argue that's just the victim of being a success. Juan mentioned in Barcelona, anybody who's been to the Ramblas in Barcelona, it's one of the world's great streets. There's only so much space, there's only so many people that you can fit in there. So maybe, what do you do? You just have to accept the fact that it's going to be busy. I'm going to come back to that afterwards. But I know in the first presentation, we also held about the importance of how you use spaces, which is something I'm going to return to as well. Uh, much worse than expected, I saw overcrowding there. Um, and again, also a little bit of an issue with the quality and practicality of group facilities as well. So that's what the clients were thinking. And here are some of the comments that they were making. Generally, you know, how far the coaches are. Toilets get mentioned a lot, I must say, inside. But they were again saying most people were very welcome. Uh, also that, that Rome was more crowded and dirty than they thought, but then other places were friendlier. So this is just an example of some of the, the ideas and thoughts that the clients were saying. Uh, generally, welcome, beautiful topography. Uh, Rome, I gave as an example, it was mixed. They said it was beautiful for its sights, but they were surprised by how much graffiti. So actually, the city itself surprised them both positively and negatively. Uh, sorry, I had to do a slide of a toilet. Um, this was one issue, toilet facilities that they really had. They were quite surprised by this. Uh, they love places like Venice, but they were surprised again by some of the crowding. Notice the crowding's coming back. And then we did a third survey. Whoops, sorry. We did a third survey. And that, I'm, I'm half Italian, basically. I talk with my hands all the time. It's a trouble. Um, we did a survey this year of residents with La Nazione newspaper in Florence. Uh, these are in Italian, but don't worry. I do speak Italian. I can uh, help you with a few of the things here. And we asked the residents, the people that lived in the city, what do you think? And one of the things that we asked them, this is just two examples, was about the economic impacts. And very interestingly, they thought that both tourism had both an impact in making prices go up, making it more expensive to rent or buy in the city, but at the same time that it gave the opportunity to get more sort of investment in the city and also gave a lot more money to the city as well. So they saw both the positive and negative side. And when we looked at the social side of things, for example, they felt on the one hand it was pushing people out of the city center and I know that this is also an issue in uh, Barcelona, for example, and making them live elsewhere. But at the same time, if you look further down, that it that, that gives them a sense of pride socially, and that also it gives congestion, but also gives them greater commercial opportunity. So everybody was recognizing the two sides of tourism, shall we say. That it's not just all negative, negative, negative. There was positive as well. It was a combination of the two things. And finally, we asked about perception. I don't know if you know, obviously, the program, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? We were very, very curious to see how much they knew. And the thing that they really underestimated was how much tourism gave. Lots of people felt it was, I don't know, 650 million euros or maybe a bit more. It's actually 2.1 billion euros is the current estimate. So that's a big thing. How much do people actually know about the importance of tourism? OK, and then how they were going to use this to develop the, uh, the, the tourism in the city about more control, security, looking at overcrowding, these side of things. We've heard that also with Benito and with Scotland. It's very important to involve the local people. So coming on, how do you spread visitors about? Because this is one of the messages that's come out of this. Uh, really just forcing people to not go to places or artificially stopping people is not necessarily the way to go. We saw that with Benito, definitely, and also with Scotland. It's important to involve the local people. Uh, we actually take part with a, an organization called CELT, the Center 
of uh, expertise for leisure tourism and hospitality. And they work on a visitor pressure project with these six cities at the bottom, including Barcelona. And we work there to discuss both the statistics, the facts that are coming through, but also to work together with all those people you've just heard about. So it's really important to have the right people together talking. One thing I would say to you, if you've been on the tube here in London, I'm guilty of this, I live in London, sometimes you see the person who stands on the right-hand side of the tube and you think, bloody pain in the ass, get out of the way, what are you doing? But what if you stop seeing that person as a tourist and you start seeing them as a visitor, a guest, an investor, an ambassador, or a marketeer? My suggestion, our suggestion at ETOA would be this is one of the issues. You've got to start thinking about how you see the people that are coming. This is the attitude on the street in Berlin, anti-tourism, go out of here, go away, that's surely not the way to start. Even if there's a lot of them, even if they're in big coaches, etc., this is not the way to go. This is what the Kelp Project is looking at, working on this front. Amsterdam is a great example of a city where they have the I Amsterdam. This was not just designed for people coming and visiting the city, but it was also for the people that lived there. And what they did was they took the areas outside the very centre and they said to them, if you were marketing, what would you do? So just for example, if you know the area of De Pape, they said, well, it's city life. It's where you meet the Amster Amsterdamers. And so the local people that lived there became part of the marketing campaign. And the other thing that you've got to think is, what are you being sold when you go and travel? How can you do this? Experience is one of the great things at the moment. People like to go to local markets, such as the Boqueria in uh, Barcelona. It creates its own problems, but there are ways of dealing, asking people to shop at certain times to allow the locals as well. But at least, at least then, the visitors are mixing with the locals and vice versa. And this comes on also in the product, hands-on. People more and more love to do hands-on things, cooking, learning about dancing, learning the language, all these sort of things, to not create this artificial gap. And another way, and this is one of my favourite pubs here in London, is to just go and join in in a pub or a bar. Again, let's not create these artificial barriers. This has been one of the great things, and it's very important in our area. Uh, the Grax Picnic Basket, they're members of ours, was a thing where they showed how many great produces there were. The local area has blossomed both for locals and for visitors because they make such a deal about the fact they are one of the best places to go eating in Austria. So the locals are also doing really well out of it. And if you go to one of our members, Expedia, they're also saying, find a story. So again, they're trying to personalise, trying to make people realise when they visit, they're actually doing more than just going and taking a load of photos. And so finally, my conclusions. Connectivity and infrastructure are crucial. We heard that in the earlier things. You've got to make sure that people are aware of the visitor economy. I think all of you, in a way, have mentioned this. What are the attractions and the themes here? Don't try and be something you're not. Benito is never going to be the same as Barcelona, and Barcelona is not going to be the same as Benito, and neither is the north of Scotland. Um, engage local residents and businesses. I think all of us have somehow said this. Engage with visitors as they can be your ambassadors. And don't forget, experiences are great, but emotions are even better. We need to be remembering that's what we're doing. I think I might be a minute or two over, and I have to apologize. Uh, a Swiss friend of mine told me once when I was in an Indian event, he said, in Switzerland, we have the most accurate watches. And my Indian friend, and that's me, he said, and in India, we have time. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have 15 minutes for questions. Who's got the first question? always rely on Vicky. Question about over-tourism, if I may, Harold. Um, I'm curious, talking about partnerships, what discussions go on between destinations who have been suffering from over-tourism between each other and the way to handle it? Did you get the question? I, I'm not sure about the, the question that you have said. I'm question was, are you talking to other cities about the problem? And I know you are, because you're talking to Seoul. Thank you, excuse me. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, in fact, Barcelona, um, uh, specifically in Barcelona, uh, have a long tradition to talk with other cities in several international networks related fundamentally around the promotion uh, of the tourism. But recently, from our uh, short history managing tourism, we have arrived clearly to the conclusion to the need to share with other cities like us uh, strategies, experiences, and um, ways to do it. 
because uh, it's absolutely necessary for, for survive. Just last week in Barcelona, we have met with 15 uh, European cities uh, talking about the vacational renting in the cities. That is a main problem probably that we have now. But uh, we are interested and um, committed with them and to continue uh, working together because a, a lot of problems that we identified and we said in, in, in any presentation had the common problems that they have the common solutions. And probably the experiences from others are very use, will be very, very useful for us and for, for others, I think. Just because just I'm probably in the room here somewhere, but uh, just so my half, the, that project, the Kelt project, is the six cities, and we've got involved, obviously, because we bring the kind of private sector operator side of things as well, and it's very important for us as well. But uh, it's really, as we have as lots of members' destinations, those six cities, it's interesting because Barcelona's one of them, but you can imagine, for example, that Amsterdam and Barcelona have things that maybe Copenhagen doesn't, but it... It's, it's actually good to see cities that are similar and yet different also sharing what the, the areas. I think that's very important as well. You know, it would be possible for just the, the big capital cities to all very similar to do the same thing, but I think they can all learn from each other as well, however big or small. Benito can learn from Barcelona, I would argue, and Barcelona can learn from Benito. So we'll ask Benito. Okay, uh, listen, I had an in, in international networking I had the opportunity with uh, two cities, was uh, Sintra in Portugal, has the same problem of car carrying capacity, and Veneza, Venice, okay, about carrying capacity, carrying capacity. And in Brazil, we have things with Paraty, it's a little city too, with carrying capacity. The, the issue is carrying capacity, is this. We we'll share with three. Who has the next question? A question for the destinations. Beyond carrying capacity, what have been your key social or environmental issues that you've had to face? So the question is, beyond just the academic idea of carrying capacity, which is very academic, what are the key questions which are confronting these destinations? So maybe we ask Benito and Scotland and Barcelona. Caroline, we'll start with Scotland. Um, I guess the issue of over-tourism is, with the exception of probably Edinburgh, um, has not really been a major issue for us um, to date. So we've really been looking at getting more visitors uh, into Scotland. However, interestingly, in the last three months, the uh, issue of certain sites in Scotland becoming over-visited over -visited has come up. So it's very interesting to be sitting in on this discussion. And interestingly, they're not the cities, they are rural areas where the infrastructure is not able to cope. And the discussion which I think we will be having in Scotland over the next uh, few months is whose responsibility is it to sort out these infrastructure issues? So for example, there is a, a, a place on Sky, the Isle of Sky, called the Fairy Pools. And it's been um, advertised in the New Visit Scotland campaign, but it's also all over all over social media. Um, and the number of visitors has gone from 10,000, you have to walk up to these pools, um, to 80,000 in the space of a year. And there is very little parking available. So it's having an impact on the residents that are there, it's having an impact on the quality of the road, it's having an uh, impact on the people who own the land. Um, and so I don't have an answer, but um, it's an issue which we're starting to have to address. Um, and I think that might be the fortunate position, but I'm not entirely certain. Um, beyond the, the, the specific problems like overcrowding and others uh, that we said, I think that there are a, a previous uh, challenge that is to build the way to solve together these problems. Um, the governance of tourism in the city is, in the case of Barcelona probably, the main issue now, because in the, our short, short um, way, we have, uh, the, the, the tourists have been perceived for, from the population as a problem related only with the industry and the administration. And tourism uh, in Barcelona, tourism in, in, within the city, is not a, a, a problem related only with the industry. Neighborhoods, uh, commerce, uh, uh, all of them are involved in the, in the problem and needs to be involved in the solution. 
to build um, tools for solve that and to mm, build tools for share uh, perceptions are, in my, in my opinion, the first, the first challenge that we have now. Overcrowding needs solutions, but the solutions do not, are not the same. If we are not, we are only from the administration, public, public administration, or is a, 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 are solutions uh, built on think together with others? I think that is an important thing. So in Bonito, all the attra natural attractions uh, have the uh, carrying capacity uh, and have the license, the environment license. So it's for us, it's very, very important because our uh, place, our region is a very, very special. So uh, how can I say fragile? Fragile. fragile. So if we receive a lot of tourists, we you know, we, our place is gonna, uh, so it, it's destroyed. So for us, it's very, very important. I think there are three hands up in the room. I'm gonna collect the questions together because we're running out of time. There's a lady here. Could you give her the microphone, please? Hi, I've got a question to, to uh, the Barcelona representative. That what exactly do you do uh, to manage the illegal accommodation, as you said, so I presume it's Air, uh, Airbnb, and what exactly do you do to use the city space better? Just give us some practical examples of what you actually do, how you manage it. Okay, My name is Hans Dominicus, Kelt. Um, I see uh, parallels between Scotland and Barcelona, as in this study we did, we found one of the ten strategies to is spreading tourism. Now, knowing the techniques and how to do that, you could also get people to areas which are not visited yet, which makes that depopulation, etc., can be supported by tourism. And I wonder whether this idea is already supported, for instance, in Scotland or, for instance, in Barcelona. Thank you. And the question here. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, this question is for Scotland. Uh, how, how, how time did it take to um, integrate all these institutions? And what are strategies that you had to put this all together? So if we take the Barcelona question first, which was, what are you doing to control the illegal holiday lets? Um, it's difficult to answer uh, exactly. Do you said exactly? No, <laughs> it's difficult to do it. Um, the, just last week, that I said before, uh, we have talking about that with other cities, and the, the first uh, opinion, the first um, sensation, is that the reality is really different in, in the different cities. Even talking about the same thing. Uh, depends of the regulation, depends of uh, the, the kind, the, the definition of the uh, tourism apartment in any place, and etc. What are we doing exactly? Uh, the first, the first thing that we have, we have had, uh, have been the, the to, to stop the licenses for tourism apartments last year, because uh, the, the the experience was that it was increasing acceleratedly, absolutely fast, and uh, the city council needs to think about that and to des design a strategy. To stop the licenses means that a lot of initiatives that the people have as uh, uh, published in Airbnb are out of legality, out of or unlicensed, I mean, and that means that we need to enforce the enforcement, to, to reinforce, to, 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 to strain the, 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 the measures for faith against the, that's illegality. The problem uh, of that, um, and the third, the third way probably is how we talk or we work with plat the, the platforms exactly. Um, it's probably not the issue or the main issue because the platform is an intermediate, very important for us. And um, the, the problem, in, in, in the, according to the, the rules of Barcelona, of the Catalonia, the problem is from the owner of this, the, the tourism apartment who, who is published in Airbnb or another platform, but it's true that we need together uh, with other cities a common, ex a common um, strategy for uh, arrive or to, to, to commit with, 
with Airbnb and other um, global platforms ways to commit with the uh, city experience and with the, the city future of, tour, of tourism. It's impossible to, to, um, to maintain the sustainability in the city even the, without an agreement with the, the main operators and Airbnb and others, Airbnb because you have said, uh, um, are uh, a big operators in the world and that is intervening and is um, modifying deeply the reality in the city and we need to to arrive some common uh, um, agreement with uh, all the actors in the city this, this was a big issue in the discussion on Monday and one of the things that came out very clearly is that the mechanisms the regulatory mechanisms available in different cities are so different that different solutions need to be found in different cities and that's going to be a challenge for a long time can we go to the second question, which was about this dispersal question? Can you just disperse the tourists? Mallorca has done this, and they're now very worried because the problem that they had on a few beaches is now all over their mountains. They've got bicycles and trekking all over the place. So they've dispersed the tourists, but actually what they've done is spread the impact, and some of that impact is very negative. So that raises an interesting question. Now, I know that comes up in Barcelona, but let's try Scotland and Benito. Uh, first, and then maybe come back to Barcelona. So, in terms of moving people away from the hotspots, um, the hotspot in Scotland is Edinburgh, um, and something like 70% of visitors that come into Scotland go to Edinburgh as part of their visit. So, most people fly into Edinburgh um, or Glasgow as our international, main international airports. So, both the cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, are now starting to look at how their marketing, which has to date focused on keeping people in the city for as long as possible and getting them to spend lots of money um, to try and get them to get them out of the cities and into the areas around. So for example, using Glasgow as a city center break with the culture and the music and the shopping, but also going out to the national park, which is only half an hour on the train away um, and extending the stay. So on a city level, that is only now starting to come into, into, the, into the marketing side of things. In terms of the more rural areas, so the example of the fairy pools that I gave you, um, it's really dependent on the destination um, and where do we move people to and do we end up with the Mallorca situation whereby we have people everywhere. We're not at that stage in the Highlands, I'm delighted to say. But I think a lot of it comes down to social media and to the word of mouth, which is so important at the moment. And I will probably get told off for saying this, but Loch Ness is the place that people want to go to, the Isle of Skye and Loch Ness. However, in my opinion, there are many, many more beautiful lochs than Loch Ness. So if you were speaking to me, I would say visit Loch Ness. However, go beyond. And I think it comes down to the community and the people and us recommending other places to people as well. I do want to let Benito in, but, but briefly. Briefly. Okay, in Benito don't have, it's, it's a little different, okay, because we have 40 different natural attractions. Uh, 38, it's private, okay? Now we are trying to, to, to increase this with the national park, to visit the national park, because nowadays it's forbidden, okay, by the environmental laws. And we are trying to, to do this, but it's just this, we have 40. Uh, for the natural attractions, and it's difficult to say go this, go here, go there, go there. You are doing marketing for this, okay? Thank you very much. Bonito. Thank you very much. I just want to get the, the answer to this gentleman's question, which was the last question, and then we're going to wrap up. So, Nick, I'm going to ask you to do this one. The question was, how long does it set take to get these partnerships to work together? <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, I'll, yes, I'll give you a very brief answer. Look, the, the honest truth is, in some cases, and I'm, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Barcelona and ourselves are a great example of this. We met when in May, and we're running an event in two weeks' time with the local tourism industry and the city council to make sure, as I hope I showed in my presentation, we have all the right partners in there. We listen to the visitors, but we listen to the residents. We help the city council, who obviously have to act in between a little bit, and also the travel industry. So I think that can be very quick. But I'd be a liar if I didn't say there are some destinations, I probably won't be unkind enough to mention them here now, where there's a long feeling that the people who are, certainly the city administration side, either don't care enough, or all they really are concerned about is the voters, and tourists don't have votes. And if they take that attitude, and it's very closed off, 
the travel industry gets very annoyed because they feel they're being, you know, they're being charged a lot. Uh, the visitors come away saying, well, I had a nice time with the people, but the setup was a bit odd, and no one's really a winner. So that would be, that would be it can be done really quickly, as Barcelona ourselves are proving, but there are other occasions where I tear my hair out. It's been done quickly in Barcelona because they've been at it since about 2008. There's a long history to what's been happening in Barcelona. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. There's another session starting right now in here, which I hope you're all staying for on communicating responsible tourism. And those of you who are interested in campaigning, one of the issues coming up in that is campaigning. But could I ask you to thank the panel.